Even two players of the same skill level will find success with different heroes because they push different playstyles. Like, just to be honest, that seems blatantly like a false statement. The following is being posted on behalf of John McIntyre, Hearthstone Battlegrounds lead designer. Hello, tavern goers. As we wrap up the current Battlegrounds Buddies patch and prepare for the upcoming Rise of Naga Battlegrounds season, I want to share some data from this past patch, from the Buddy patch, so that'll be interesting, and explain some of our design philosophies when it comes to designing and balancing heroes. Bit of a messy sentence, but that's fine. First, let's look at the overall active player MMR distribution right now. The top 50% of players have reached 5,700. The top 25% have reached 6,500. The top 10% of players have reached 7,000 MMR. Congrats to the top 1% of players who have reached 8,300 MMR. That is different than the HS Replay data. A lot different. But, of course, that makes sense because HS Replay only has data for people that use HS Replay. Because if we go to the last 7 days i want to go beyond that and see what the top one percent would be for like last patch for example but we can't it's usually like 10 or 11k so i guess people that use hs replay just have higher mmr in general which makes sense because if you're super casual you're just not using a tracker we want to show the top 10 performing heroes for all players all right so this is still under buddies right care so this is overall cariel rome Chanbala, Flurgal, George, Eni. Interesting. So that's why Eni got the nerf hammer multiple times, I guess. She was good for lower MMR players, but she was not good at all. Like, very opposite in higher MMR. And same with Jaraxxus and Maleficent. Okay, and they also got Patches, Tavish, and Ysera. And same with Ysera and, and Patches and Tavish. So most of these heroes were really bad in high MMR, which is really interesting. But also something I noticed with these heroes is that not all of them, but most of them force a tribe. So, with the exception of Cariel, George, and Tavish, all the rest of them are like a built in here's what you go for, this is the tribe you want to buy. Which makes sense if you don't play the game that much, you don't really know the meta, you would be served better by a hero that tells you what you should do. And yeah, Cariel is like, oh, you just press a button. Especially with the buddy giving you the, the other scaling. If you don't know how to build a scaling comp, doesn't matter what you have, it's gonna buff it, <laughs> right? So, it makes sense. And then Tavish, I guess, is just disruptive with um, the snipe every turn. And it's not scaling, really, but it, it is a buff on board that you automatically get. <laughs> now let's compare that list to the top 10 heroes for our top 1% during the same period. Arana... Flurgle. Flurgle is probably the only one on both lists, if I'm guessing. I don't think Chen Bala would make it for this list. George? Oh, George. Too. Okay, cool. George. Mukla, Maev, Finley, Mutinous, Gallywix, Fulgen, Zephyr. One of the reasons I'm sharing this information is to show that there isn't a universal hero ranking that applies to all players. Heroes perform differently depending on player skill and engagement with the mode. A lot of players find success with minion type focused heroes because they provide a clear direction, but those same heroes don't perform as well for our most competitive players. Even two players of the same skill level will find success with different heroes because they push different playstyles. This seems like um, a little bit of a reach because like, okay, what kind of data set are you basing that on? If you're basing that on one game, of someone playing patches for one game, someone else playing patches for one game, and like one of them winning, one of them losing, that they just got different, you know, matchups, different minions, different luck. So I don't think you can really say that. Like, just to be honest, that seems blatantly like a false statement. I don't know, what do you think about that chat? Like, I think in general, most high tier players can all win with all these heroes. It's not like, oh, I'm a top tier player, but I can only win with Gallywix and Mukla, and I can't win with Maev and Vol'jin. Like, no, I've, all, all top tier players could win with all these heroes. The takeaway here is that players shouldn't feel obligated to pick only the heroes that work best for the top 1% of players, but should instead experiment with different heroes to see what performs best for their skill bracket, level of engagement with the game and playstyle. No, if the data shows that certain heroes are more effective against against your peers in, in your bracket, you should pick the heroes that perform better there. Sure, if you're a top tier player, you can, you can pick these heroes and win against players that are picking these heroes, for sure. Obviously, because otherwise these heroes would also be winning in this bracket if they were good enough, but they're not. 
So you shouldn't pick these heroes if you're a top tier player because you'll lose. And if you... <laughs> and I don't think that makes any sense. Two people might try different comps, aggro versus passive, a great zone, a great example. Yeah, because I think, I mean, people that are... Players that are good are going to play the best strategy and that's why they win. How... <laughs> you can't be a good player winning consistently and just like F around with heroes you like. I don't know. I think good players like... I don't think this is true though. Even if you might... I don't think there are different play styles really. Sure there are different comps, but... Overall, good players just play what wins. That's always how it is. But I don't think this makes any sense. There isn't one catch-all best strategy, sure. Sure, there might be an ideal Vulgen strategy, but you just might not get the things for that, and you might have to go with another one. Um, but that doesn't mean that you wouldn't rather go with the best one. You just didn't end up being able to. He's saying that players are forcing certain things when really they're playing what works. And I don't think this is a takeaway here either, because this part is true. Players shouldn't feel obligated to pick only the heroes that work best for top 1% of players. That's definitely true. If you don't know how to play like Gallywix, which is a little tricky, or you don't know how to play Vulgin or Mutinous the, the right way, you sure you shouldn't pick those, but you should just maybe like learn how to do it right. It's like if you're in a lower MMR bracket and you're picking these and you're winning cool, but once you start climbing, you'll start losing if you just only continue to pick these heroes. Even if you like them, even if you love Ysera, you love it, and you're like, I win with her at 2000 MMR, you could get to, like, if you get to 5000, 6000 playing Ysera a lot, you're gonna start losing because she sucks at higher MMR. So you're gonna have to learn how to play the heroes that work in higher MMR, right? Unless you don't care, then sure, you can literally pick any hero and do whatever. If you don't care about winning, then okay, then that's true, right? But like, so I don't think this makes sense. I do think there are different play styles, but I don't think they all are equal. My play style is more tempo. Like if I were to pick my play style, I'd be like, yeah, I want to play a tempo game and like build up my board and um, be consistent, yada yada. And I don't want to power level and just try to get a good trip of one specific tribe, but I'm going to lose. That just means I lose more. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> You just shy away from here, like Shutterwalk and favorite hero like Mukla. But Mukla's a good hero. So in that way, I think it's true that each hero has an ideal strategy and way that they should be played to get the optimal results from that hero, the end. I don't think that there's multiple strategies you can follow with most heroes. There might be like two. For example, Arana has elementals. She recently added murlocs to her strategies but before that it was elementals elementals only and you could say a third strategy is like the beast thingies but most games you're gonna not have all three of those tribes in you're gonna have one or two of those in that means you have one or two strategies that can help you make top two and that's it Flurgal, you've one you have one strategy it's murlocs george you have two poison murlocs or quillbor Mukha, you have two divine shield minions or demon plus beasts, but demon plus beasts are usually just not in, at least when I play it, so you have divine shields. You know what I mean? Mukla isn't a winning hero, it's literally on this list. Oh, are you talking about back when Shutterwalk was and Mukla wasn't? Sure, but in that case though, by not picking the better hero, you're just probably consigning yourself to getting third and fourth instead of first or second. And so in the long run, it's just losing you MMR. One of the goals with hero balance is to keep hero diversity high by making sure the heroes are kept in an appropriate band of power. We look at all skill levels when trying to identify which heroes need a nerf or buff. That's why we sometimes adjust a hero that is over or underperforming for newer players, even if those same issues aren't seen by our most competitive player. Fine and reasonable. I sort of have a problem with the, this appropriate band of power, because that seems to be acknowledging that some heroes are designed to be bad which I don't like. I do think ideally all heroes would be kept around the same level of power so that they would all be viable and every player would have a chance to win the game instead of like someone's chance to win being boosted by like 20% over everybody else or something. You know what I mean? I don't think your likelihood of winning the game or getting last should be affected by the 
opening screen of the game. I think if you get four bottom tier heroes, four tier four heroes for someone that gets to pick a tier one hero, you shouldn't have, a, you know, a 30, 40, 20, even a 10%. You shouldn't have that much less chance to win than them. You should help. Everyone should have an equal chance to win from the beginning. Because when you start being like, well, okay, it's like running a race. And it's like, oh, you get to start halfway down the track. You get to start 200 meters ahead. You have to start behind the starting line. Then I hate that. I just don't like that. With this in mind, what happens if a hero is too weak for one group of players but can't be buffed because then it'd be too strong for other players? This was a design challenge we faced with Shutterwalk. Oh, hey, there's your example, Scooter. After the launch of Buddies, Shutterwalk repeats all of the battle cries you've triggered this game. Most players' strategy was heroes to buy lots of battle cry minions and then use their hero power as late as possible to copy a bunch of battle cry effects. However, top players use a different strategy. They mostly buy battle cry minions that summon other minions, and then they repeat those effects with the hero power for triple rewards. That strategy is harder to execute but more powerful. Shutterwalk needed a buff for the majority of players, but we didn't want our changes to have a large impact on top players. Our design change was for the buddy to give plus two plus two to the battle cry minions that adds to the shop. This helped keep players alive when they were- but wasn't the nerf to Shutterwalk actually just getting rid of one of the tokens? This helped keep players alive when they were buying many different types of battle cry minions, but it didn't have as large of an impact for the players looking to buy the one or two specific battle cry minions. I hope that example helps show how even though not all individual balance changes are for every player, we do balance for every player. I don't think it shows that. As a final note, nerfs are a higher priority than buffs because a hero being too strong warps games more than a hero being too weak. I think it warps data, which, I mean, if you don't play test, then data is the only feedback you have for your game. You're not getting the data of people who just had no chance in the game or had to struggle to get fourth or fifth because their hero sucked. So you would see overtuned heroes reflected in the data more, for sure but not really in the gameplay experience, in my opinion. <laughs> With Rise of the Naga, we expect a big meta shakeup, and we're excited to see what you all make of it. As this new meta develops, we'll be playing the same balance philosophy when it comes to assessing player feedback and looking at data. He's just saying, like, we're not gonna change the way we balance this game. We're not gonna listen to your feedback at all. And we're just gonna keep doing what we're doing. Yeah, I just disagree with this design philosophy in general, and I think it's more of a, more of a lazy approach. It's the approach where you want to keep everything even, but it's how you get there that matters, that, 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 that can vary. So you could get there by really looking at, you know, how each hero performs in every game, you know, and buffing up ones that are too weak and taking down ones that are too strong and trying to keep them all around the same power level. Or you could deliberately make half of them strong and half of them Weak. and then 10% of them really strong and 10% of them really weak. So then overall, that's gonna result in 50% win rate for everybody. But there are so many heroes that the first way would take a lot of effort and time just for manpower and uh, resources. It's much more cost efficient to do it the second way, which is capitalism. Do everything the cheapest way regardless of the quality of the final product. Anyway. That's my opinion. <laughs>